Go ahead, Lucas. Uh, thank you, and uh, thanks everyone for listening and the organizer for the opportunity. Um, my name is Luca Martin. I am a student of Martin Sperlinger, and this is a work based on a paper uh, I collaborate with uh, Sergio Iguri, uh, Nicolás Kovensky, and Leila Maestri. So uh, some of the organizers may be familiar with it. Uh, we are going to talk about blending modes and the reflection symmetry in ADF3. So we can, yes. Uh, first, we start uh, discussing the uh, Euclidean model. Uh, the counterpart is in H3 with Sumino Novikov Widdle model. Um, in this uh, model, we have uh, primary traits, phi labeled by the letter J. And also, we have that vertex operators. And the letter J can take values in that expression. And we can use word identities to get the uh, two point function. And we can see a, a dependence of uh, one plus J plus J in the, del the first delta and the second delta J minus J. We have the first term of that is the contact term in the X coordinates. And the second one uh, we have a name as bulk term. Yes. So. If we uh, read the dependence of J, we see that uh, we, we, you could say that the first term is useless in this range of value for the J, but uh, later it would be uh, very important. The representations PJ and P minus Y and minus J are unitary equivalents and there exists a reflection symmetry between both of them. And we can uh, find a state P to J from the state minus one minus j. And if we reflect one field in the propagator, we turn one term, the contact term, into the bulk term and vice versa. So we can pass the next. Well, that was the Euclidean model. And we are going to talk about the Lorentzian model. The Lorentzian model uh, will have operators labeled by an, an M letter that we we have to construct from the another oper the operators in the Euclidean model through a transformation that is called Melin transformation. And that is expression. And we can uh, do the Melin transformation of the two fields before and obtain the propagator with having the same dependence of J, like the delta one plus J plus J and the delta J minus J. Nice. But uh, also, we can get the reflection symmetry for the uh, new status and in, in the uh, SL2R <laughs> with Sumino Novico with the model and recover the old expression for the reflection. Nice. It's, it's, it's as easy as to Melin transform the old one in the Euclidean model. So we can uh, pass the slide, please. Yeah, thank you. But uh, this spectrum from the Lorentzian model is incomplete, and uh, people like Alacena, Uri, and a lot of serious people uh, say that we have to consider a spectral flow automorphism who uh, will give places to new non equivalent representation because of the non compactness of the space. So we'll have new states uh, labeled by the big J. Now, look at the big J, it's really important <laughs> that it will be constructed from the uh, old little j status in the uh, Lorentzian mode. And we have the new transformation of Melin in the uh, capital uh, J and M. If we can proceed. Well, these new status of big J are vertex operators that uh, belong to a well-defined zero mode representation. So you can say that the propagator will have that form uh, with the dependence of delta j minus j, and we can calculate and update that. That's what people do. But uh, from our perspective, we uh, are lacking the dependence of one plus big j plus big j, and this is not in the delta right here. So we are going to name this term only the bulk term of the propagator, and we are going to say that we have to find a new reflection symmetry for this uh, capital J states. And if we obtain that, we will be able to uh, have the another term, the contact term, that will have the dependence of 
the delta one plus big J plus big J. So in the next slide, please. Thank you. We propose the following dependence for the generalized reflection symmetry in the new uh, capital J. We have to propose that and we have to verify that it's, it's readable and it recovers all the expression that we need to recover. And we can use it to calculate the contact term of the two point function by reflecting one term in the bulk uh, two point function that uh, until now it, we, like, people thought that it was only the, the two point function. So if we do that, we obtain the uh, famous contact term and we see that we recover the delta one plus j plus j. Yes, right. That, uh, that dependence that we uh, didn't have before. So uh, we can now say that we have the complete propagator that is the sum of the bulk propagator plus the counter propagator. So we can now discuss a new uh, factorization for the propagator and normalization for the fields, like that uh, S variables and so on. And we can now write a complete uh, dependence of the propagator having the dependence in big J like the one plus J plus J and the delta J minus J for the capital ones and the uh, non-capital ones. And we know if we uh, could that they did that uh, calculation and obtain that uh, S, L and M variables. So we are very happy with it. And now we have the full propagator and we can study singularities, uh, shear viscosity and other applications that uh, you will be happy to use. And I think I I am time, so I am happy. <laughs> yeah, you had some seconds. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. Thanks. There is no need for. I, I thought in a five minutes in, in a talk, no, in a seven minute talk, so I I couldn't okay. uh, adapt it. <laughs> okay. Thank Lucas. Uh, the next talk. Thank you very much. Uh, will be by Constanza. Quijada Barrera, uh, she will talk about the phase transition for a charged ADS soliton background. Go ahead, Constanza. Okay, thank you. Um, well, my name is Constanza Quijada, and first I would like to thank to the organizer for this opportunity. And I'm going to talk about phase transition for a charged ADS soliton background. This work is in collaboration with Andres Navalón, Patrick Concha, Julio Oliva, and Evelyn Rodríguez. In this work, we study the phase transition between two solutions to the Einstein Maxwell theory with negative cosmological constant in four dimensions. The action for this theory is given by the expression one, where R is the richest scalar and F is the neutral electromagnetic tensor. A solution for this theory is a planar charge black hole. The line element for this solution is given by two, with the function Fb defined by the equation three where M and Q are integration constants. The gate field is given in four, where R plus is the largest root of the equation Fb equal to zero. The coordinate phi B has an arbitrary period, eta B. To obtain a clear metric for the black hole, we apply a weak rotation on the temporal coordinate and we obtain the expression five. The regularity of the Euclidean metric demands that the coordinate shall be identified with period beta b given by six. The period beta, beta b is the inverse of the temperature, so the temperature of the black hole is equal to the right hand side of seven. We can obtain another solution to the theory with a double analytic continuation of the black hole metric in the coordinate t and phi. This solution is a planar soliton, which is different from the black hole solution, and its line element is given by the expression eight, with the function fs defined by nine, where mu and capital Q are an integration constant. The gate field is in equation 10, where r0 is the largest root of the equation fs equal to zero. To ensure regularity, we add a constant contribution to the gate field. This constant is related with a net magnetic flux along the set axis at the boundary. The regularity of the metric requires that the coordinate Vs has a period eta s given by the equation 11. 
The equation 12 corresponds to the Euclidean metric for the soliton solution, where the coordinate tau e is identified with the arbitrary period beta s. <clears throat> we calculate the Euclidean action for the black hole with the soliton solution as background. For this, we need that the both solutions have the same geometry at the boundary. So the matching condition when r goes to infinity are given by 13. We calculate the Euclidean action for the black hole and the soliton using the constant term method. Thus, the Euclidean action for the black hole with the soliton solution as thermal background is given by 14. From the Euclidean action, we can obtain the Gibbs free energy, which is equal to the right hand side of 15. We can see that there is a change of sign in the free energy depending on the value of mu and m. This change of sign indicates that there are phase transitions between the solutions. In order to study the phase transitions, we will express the free energy in terms of the boundary condition. We express the integration constant and a mu in terms of the periods theta and eta, the chemical potential T, and the magnetic flux capital T. The last two fields are given by 16. Thus, the free energy is equal to the right hand side of 7T where for simplicity, we have used the redefinition that appeared in 18. Our result showed that the phase transitions between the charged planar black hole and the charged soliton depend on the magnetic flux, the electric potential, and the temperature. So to study these phase transitions, we plot the magnetic flux in terms of the temperature for different values of the electric potential. We can see uh, uh, on the top of the curve, the energy of the solution are equal. So we have a second order phase transition between them. In other words, the two phases, the black hole and the soliton coexist. Out of these curves, first order phase transitions occur. Below of the curves, the soliton phase dominates and above of the curves, the black hole phase dominates. Also, we can know that um, Phase transition occurs when the temperature is equal to zero. Uh, what is different from that happened in the Hopkins phase transition? And that is, <laughs> thank you for your attention. Okay, yes, no, no problem. The, the seven minute uh, thing is optional, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. No problem. Thank you, Sansa. Okay, our next speaker is Rodrigo Castillo Vasquez. Uh, he will talk about the entanglement entropy uh, in cubic gravitational theories. Go ahead, Rodrigo. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, the opportunity. And of course, my advisor, Professor Elena Cáceres, for her support. Um, this work was done with, with her, with Professor Cáceres, and also our collaborator, uh, Alejandro Vilar López. So um, what is this all about? The motivation is that, um, well, we all know that holographic entanglement entropy is an important uh, quantity to analyze many things that happen in the ads cft correspondence. However, we realized that there, were, there was no functional for theories that are cubic uh, or up to cubic order in the Riemann tensor. We're not considering derivatives of the Riemann tensor. So we actually, um, got down to work and find this functional. Now there's the situation that arises in this in this setup is the something called the splitting problem and I will say what it is about. And finally we after getting the functional and getting around the splitting problem some to some extent we were able to apply this to a specific example which is the case of Einsteinian cubic gravity. Uh, next one please. All right, so uh, just a reminder, because there are some things that are really important for to understand the splitting problem. This is uh, what I think pretty much everyone here is familiar with already, the RT uh, formula. So we know that this was conjectured several years ago. And oh, sorry, <clears throat> there was no proof of it until uh, Lukovics and Maldacena found a proof of it. So the idea I will forgot to include some pictures about this, but I will just describe like an overview of, of how they did it. 
is that um, you you consider Renyi entropies, right? And you want to take the appropriate limit to get the entanglement entropy. Now, um, in the case of the boundary theory, what you do is you consider n copies of your boundary manifold, your boundary theory. And you know there's a permutation symmetry there, Zn permutation symmetry. Now, the great idea was to translate this into the bulk spacetime, right? So we're considering n copies of the, of the uh, bulk spacetime. And if we think that this symmetry also translates into uh, the bulk spacetime, we pretty much get the quotient manifold there. And we end up with a conical singularity that comes from the fixed points of the symmetry. Now, what they did was analyze the metric close to this conical singularity. And uh, they had uh, to impose at some point of this analysis, impose the Einstein equations on this metric and make sure that everything would uh, satisfy this. And uh, their analysis led to, yes, confirming that that conical singularity um, was the appropriate RT surface. So they actually have a way to show that. Uh, next one. So what, why do I mention this? Because for higher derivative gravity, this is pretty much what uh, Shidon and Joan Camps tried to do, follow this argument for the, you know, using the, the replica trick. However, for higher order gravities is not that straightforward, it's not easy. And one main difference is that for Einstein gravity, you have an unambiguous way to regularize the metric close to the singularity. However, for higher order gravities, that is the way to regularize close to, the, to this uh, conical singularity is not uh, unique. But uh, Shi Dong uh, came up with this expression, right? So I will, the first term in the integral, um, the, yeah, that one, thank you. Uh, that is what I, I will call the walled term. And the second one, the sum over A and all that, is known as the anomaly term. So I will refer to these two in that way. And um, next one, please. Now, uh, as I mentioned already, there is no unique way to regularize the metric close to the conical singularity. There's a procedure that is called the squash cone regularizations. And I will say that um, there are two, let's, let's two main ways that this has, done, has been done in the literature. One is the minimal, the one that I'll call minimal is in the same paper by Shidong. And uh, the other one will be uh, the non-minimal, um, which can be found. So what's the difference between, between these two? Is that uh, Shidong at no point cared much about the metric or objects uh, satisfying the equations of motion. Whereas um, Miao, he, pretty much made sure that this was done. However, you cannot impose the full equations of motion on the metric because it's too complicated. So what, what was considered was just a perturbative approach where at least these objects will satisfy the Einstein, the equations of motion for Einstein gravity. And um, we'll see that this creates a difference in the anomaly term or how to treat the anomaly term. Uh, next one. So the, all this story boils down in an arithmetic procedure where you have to do some counting. Uh, when you calculate your, all these derivatives of, of the Lagrangian with respect to Riemann tensors and whatnot, every time one of these objects on the right-hand side of these three equations shows up, you have to write it in terms of all these other objects. And then you assign like a way to some of these objects. And uh, after considering that way, you rewrite everything back again into term, in terms of the Riemann tensor, the one that is not uh, with the tilde and the extrinsic curvatures. Uh, moving on. So the, the non-minimal procedure involves this plus this other counting. Uh, let's move on. You have one minute. All right, uh, okay, there, this, this situation doesn't happen for uh, quadratic theories because, well, yeah, it simply doesn't show up. So moving on to uh, cubic theories, um, we consider a generic Lagrangian for cubic, uh, that is cubic in Riemann tensors. Next one. 
And we ended up with these two functionals for minimal and non-minimal prescription. And the only difference is seen, uh, yes, next one, in the last terms, the ones that are quartic in, in the extrinsic curvatures. And I highlighted some of these differences here. Uh, next one. Uh, so yeah, um, let's move on. We apply this to Einsteinian cubic gravity, a specific theory that has nice properties. Um, in the setup of a Poincaré, uh, a strip in the Poincaré Euclidean ADS4. And um, this is the metric that we considered. Um, moving on, next one. Uh, yeah, you, these are the equations. There are some differences, really complicated. So we had to use numerics, uh, minimize them, whatnot, the usual story. Next I'm, one. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, time's up. Maybe if you want some seconds, but time's up. Yeah, yeah. So you just wanted to show that actually we, we get different uh, entanglement surfaces oh, you, you, for each you, case. You already finished the time, so it's okay. Thanks. Okay, yeah. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, sorry, this is was the ritual. So no, I propose okay. to, to clap uh, to, to all the speakers.